Wildlife by Cynthia de Felice. Chapter 9. Eric glanced up to see Alma watching him with an odd ex expression on her face. She turned away quickly, but not before he saw the shine of tears in her eyes. "'What's the matter, Oma? he asked. He wondered what he had done wrong, or if maybe she was already regretting her decision. She shook her head, as if to clear away any unwanted thought, and said, "'Nothing's wrong, dear. It's just that, for a minute there, the two of you reminded me of... Well, I was just being silly.' There was a silence for a moment. But then, before Eric could say anything, she changed the subject. Dr. Bob said to feed her, poor thing, but I don't have any dog food. What should we give her? Oma considered this as she set a bowl of water on the floor. Then she snapped her fingers and said, I know. She went to the freezer, took out a package, of ra package wrapped in white paper, and held it up. Ground venison, she said. Best meat there is. "'That's what my friend Patrick's father says,' Eric told her. "'I've never had it, though.' "'Oh, wait until you try it,' said Oma, as she put the meat in a frying pan. "'Your friend's father is right. Big Daryl used to get a deer every year until—' "'Once again she hesitated, then measured her words. "'Well, until he stopped hunting. "'Now Jim Lunt gives us a share of his. Helps us get through the winter.' As the meat cooked, the dog's nose began to twitch eagerly. She watched intently as Oma pushed the frozen glob around with a spatula, breaking it up as it slowly browned. When it was cooked through, Oma let it cool, then scraped it into a plastic dish and placed it on the floor. The dog walked over and sniffed the food with great interest. "'What a lady!' said Oma with a laugh. "'Why, Elvis would have wolfed that down in two seconds!' "'Go ahead, girl,' Eric urged. "'It's for you.' The dog began to eat in earnest. It made Eric happy to watch her, knowing how hungry she had to be. "'Eric,' said Oma quietly, "'it would be best not to mention Elvis, "'or to say anything to Big Daryl about giving the dog meat from the freezer.' "'Meat?' Eric said, pulling an innocent face. "'What meat?' Oma's laugh rang through the kitchen. It sounded nice. He wanted to ask her about Elvis, but the dog was obviously a sensitive subject, even though he'd been dead for thirty years. He didn't want to make Oma sad again. Using an, an old blanket Oma gave him, Eric made a bed for the dog in the corner of the living room. She rested peacefully on it, and Eric sat beside her, stroking her, taking in every feature, the velvety softness of her ears, her warm, earthy smell, the pattern of large brown spots on her mottled coat, the rise and fall of her chest as she breathed. What really killed him was the way she looked right into his eyes. It was like she knew him in a way he'd never been known before. He stayed with the dog all day, or she stayed with him. Whenever he got up, even to get a glass of milk, she followed. Eric wanted her to rest, so he got some pillows off the couch and leaned against the wall beside her bed. Please, Dr. Bob, he willed. Do not call. Please don't let there be an owner. Who will take her away? As the hours passed, it became impossible to think and speak of her as the dog. Eric knew someone had probably given her a name, but he had no idea what it was, and he wanted to call her something. He thought about it all afternoon, but couldn't come up with anything. He and Oma had a quiet supper. Afterwards, she set aside a plate for Big Darrow, who still hadn't returned from harvesting beets, and switched on the news. Eric sat down beside the dog, scratched her ears, and was glad to see her close her eyes. That's a good girl, he murmured. You need to sleep, poor pup. You fought with a porcupine. You full were full of quills. You brave little quilly dog. All afternoon, he'd been whispering a similar stream of nonsense, and he might as well admit it, baby talk. But hearing himself now, he sat up straighter and repeated, quilly dog, quilly dog. He liked the sound of it. Hey, he said, what about quilly? He thought for a moment and added, or maybe just quill. What do you think about that for a name? The dog lifted her head and looked him square in the eye. 
quill, he repeated. Do you like it? The dog lifted her left eyebrow, then lowered it. What do you think? You want to be quill? She thumped her short tail, put her head on his lap, gave a deep, contented sigh, and closed her eyes again. That settled that. Eric was just telling Oma that he'd come up with a perfect name for the dog when the door opened and Big Daryl walked in. His clothes and face were dusty, and he took off his farmer's cap. Eric was once again struck by the blazing blue of his eyes and the contrast between his pale forehead and the rest of his face. He hung the cap on a hook by the door and was leaning down to unlace his boots when his gaze fell on Eric and the dog. He jerked upright as if he'd just been struck by a porcupine and stared. After what felt to Eric like a very long time, Big Daryl asked, What's that dog doing in here? His deep voice sounded to Eric like a growl. Eric stood up. Quill stirred and rose to her feet, too. With her stubby tail wagging, she approached Big Daryl. He ignored her. Oma jumped up from her seat in front of the TV and started to say, Daryl, it's only for... But Big Daryl cut her off. Didn't I say no more dogs? Eric couldn't help himself. But that was a long time ago. Big Daryl's face froze. He stiffened, and for a moment, no one moved. He turned slowly to Eric and said deliberately, What do you know about what happened here a long time ago? Eric, taken aback by the coldness in Big Daryl's gaze, stammered, Nothing. I... That's right. Nothing. Remember that. He turned back to Oma, who looked every bit as frightened as Eric felt. Eric could hardly bear looking at her, wringing her hands and blinking with anxiety. But, Daryl, I... Oma began. Big Daryl interrupted. Didn't I say no more dogs? Yes, but let me ex... There's nothing to explain, Big Daryl said flatly. The dog goes. It's not Oma's fault, Eric shouted. The dog's face was all full of porcupine quills and she couldn't eat or anything. She needed help, and Dr. Bob came. Big Daryl's eyes narrowed at this, and Eric hurried to add, He didn't even charge us anything because he's a nice guy and just wanted to help her. Not like you, he thought. The unspoken words hung in the air. If Big Daryl sensed them, he showed no sign. Quill, come, Eric said. He couldn't stand watching her standing at Big Daryl's feet, wagging her tail and sniffing his boots, waiting for a pat that wasn't going to come. When she returned to stand by him side by his side, Eric reached down to rub her head. Then he stepped forward, placing himself between Quill and Big Darrell. He tried to keep his voice even, although his hands were shaking and his heart was drumming a jerky rhythm in his chest. Oma told me, you said no more dogs. It's only until Dr. Bob finds the owner, and I've got money. If there's any charge, I'll pay for any everything. There was silence for a while. Finally, Big Darrell heaved an angry sigh and said, It's too late to do anything with it tonight. It can stay until tomorrow. No longer. Oh, Darrell, that's wonderful, isn't it, Eric? Oma said softly. Eric didn't answer. He was afraid that if he opened his mouth, he'd say what he was thinking, which was that there was no way he was going to thank Big Darrell and act all grateful because the man had said Quill could stay one lousy night in his lousy house. He and Big Darrell continued to stare at each other. Finally, Big Darrell spoke. You called it a name. Her, not it. Big Darrell said impatiently, How did you know its name? I just made it up, Eric answered, wondering what the man was getting at. Big Darrell shook his head slowly, a disgusted expression on his face. Eric had to force himself not to look away from the man's icy blue gaze. No sense in giving a name to what's not yours to keep, Big Darrell muttered. Now take that mutt out to the barn. If she's sleeping in the barn, then I am too, Eric answered. Oh, Eric, Oma began, looking distressed, but Big Darrell interrupted, saying, Suit yourself. He went into the kitchen, where he sat down and began to silently eat his supper. 
Omar gave Eric a weak smile and gently touched his shoulder. I'll talk to him, she said. Eric could hear the fear and reluctance in her voice. No, he said. Don't bother. It'll be fine. He bit his tongue to keep from saying what he wanted to say. I'd rather sleep in that old... In, I'd rather sleep out than in the same house with him any day. Eric, said Omar, almost in a whisper, won't you... I want to sleep in the barn with Quill. Oma sighed, her distress evident in her face. Wait, then. She took a flashlight from a shelf by the door. You'll need this, and a pillow, and some more blankets for yourself. I'll get them off my bed, Eric replied, and headed for the stairs. He hastily removed his bedding and put on a sweatshirt. Back in the living room, he picked up Quill's blanket. Arms full, he turned to face Oma, who appeared close to tears. I wish you'd stay inside, she said. He, I'm sleeping in the barn, Oma. It's okay, really. His grandmother reached up and fussed with the neck on his sweatshirt. Then, with a brave attempt at a smile, she said, Good night, then, and sleep well. Good night, Eric said, and escaped gratefully into the darkness. Oma turned on the porch light as he and Quill walked toward the barn. Once inside, he found the hay bales, spread out his blankets and Quill's, plumped up his pillow and stretched out with Quill beside him. He buried his flushed and angry face in the warm fur of her neck. For a long time he lay awake, his hands curling into fists at his sides, and he thought about Big Darrell. What's his problem, anyway? What did I ever do to him? Him and all his stupid rules. Don't go in that room. Didn't I say no dogs? No sense in naming something that's not yours. I don't know how Oma, Oma can stand living here alone with him. There's no way I can take it for six months. I won't make it one more day in that house. The instant he stopped thinking about Big Darrell, he worried that Dr. Bob would call at any moment, having found Quill's owner. He tried to think of some way, any way, to keep her. But there was no solution, not as long as he lived under Big Darrell's roof. Chapter 10 In the morning, Eric lay awake, dreading having to see Big Darrell. To his relief, he heard the kitchen door shut, followed by the sound of the truck starting up. He got up and watched from the barn as Big Darrell drove off. Evidently, the beet harvest continued, even on Sunday, and Eric was glad of it. When he walked into the house, Oma made a big to-do over him and Quill, asking how they'd slept and what they'd like for breakfast. Eggs would be great. Eric said, please. Eric, Oma said softly, you mustn't mind Big Darrell. He has a lot on his mind. Eric was still too angry to answer, even if he could have thought of something to say to that. She continued apologetically. He called this morning. Dr. Bob is going to come for the, for Quill later today. Eric felt his jaw clench in fury. Oma blinked, looking as helpless as he felt. I'm sorry, she whispered. After a long silence, she sighed and looked down at Quill, who was sitting by Eric's feet. Now what on earth are we going to feed you this morning? she asked. I guess it'll have to be ham and eggs for you and Eric both. How does that sound? Quill thumped her tail. As Oma busied herself cooking, Eric examined Quill's face. There was a little swelling, but it wasn't bad at all, and she seemed to be acting just fine. Oma handed Eric a plate of fried eggs, cooked crispy on the edges the way he liked them. She told him she was going to church and asked if he wanted to come along. I'll just stay here. Dr. Bob's coming, remember? He said bitterly. He reached for his fork and began to eat, barely tasting the food. Oma broke several more eggs over the remaining ham and toast and placed the dish on the floor for Quill. Well, my friend will be coming for me soon said Oma, so I better get ready. After a moment, she said suddenly, I suppose you think I am silly not to drive. Eric, surprised, looked up. Her eyes were shiny with tears again, and she said, I used to, but I stopped after... She hesitated for a moment, wide-eyed, then plunged ahead. Well, I stopped after we lost Dan. She paused again, then took a deep breath. There, I said it. Eric licked his lips and swallowed uneasily, not knowing what to say. Did you tell did your mother tell you about your uncle Dan? Oma asked. He nodded. Quill, maybe sensing the tension in the room, came over, 
and placed her head in his lap. He stroked her ears as Oma continued. After we got the news about Dan, I had two accidents in the car in one week. I couldn't even say how they happened. I don't know where my mind was. I haven't trusted myself to drive since then. And now it's been so long, thirty-four years, I can scarcely believe it. Her voice trailed off. She looked so small right then and so forlorn, Eric hurried to say, I don't think you're silly, Oma. Thank you, Eric. She smiled wanly and added, I expect Big Daryl does. Eric wanted to tell her he didn't care what Big Daryl thought, but he kept silent. Big Daryl was her husband, after all, and Eric kept having the feeling that there were things happening that he didn't understand. It felt good to say Dan's name out loud just now, Oma said. I say it all the time in my prayers, of course, but Big Daryl doesn't like me to talk about Dan. Her voice low, she added, he stopped going to church after Dan died, and he doesn't pray. He says, he says, the God who allowed his son to die is dead to him. She looked at Eric with eyes full of sorrow and whispered, Poor Daryl. This confused Eric even further. Poor Daryl, he thought. Was she crazy? To hide his discomfort, he got up and took his empty plate to the sink to wash it, and was relieved when Oma said she was going upstairs to get dressed for church. Eric took Quill outside, unable to sit in that sad kitchen for one more moment. Angrily, he picked up a stick and threw it as hard as he could. Quill chased it, picked it up, ran back to his side, and sat. When Eric held out his hand, she very gently opened her mouth and allowed him to take it. A wave of, fe of affection and regret swept through Eric, and he dropped to his knees to hold Quill's smooth ears and put his face to hers. How could he stand to give her up? Oma's friend pulled into the driveway, and Oma came outside dressed for church. There's a coffee hour after service, she told Eric, and I'm on the cleanup committee afterwards. Then Rosemary and I have more decorating to do for the Harvest Festival. So I'll be gone until, oh, about two o'clock or so. Are you sure you'll be all right? I'll be fine, Eric told her. She looked as if she might be about to say more. Then she gave her head a quick little shake and said, Okay, then, I'll see you after church. She waved as the car pulled away, and Eric waved back half-heartedly. As if to remind him of what they were supposed to be doing, Quill threw the stick for herself by tossing her head to send it flying. Eric could have sworn she grinned at him before she ran after it. It was almost impossible to remain grouchy with Quill so rambunctious and cheerful, but the reality of Eric's situation was beginning to sink in, hard. It was Sunday. Dr. Bob was coming soon to take Quill. Maybe, just maybe, he'd have been able to stand being here if he had Quill to keep him company. But without her? All he had to look forward to was starting at a new school where he didn't know anybody and had no friends. Everything about Fortuna, North Dakota, seemed strange and foreign, and Eric had every reason to think the kids would be different, too. What if all the guys were as weird as and unfriendly as Big Daryl? He thought about what Oma had said about Big Daryl and Dan, and his mind returned to the bedroom at the top of the stairs. He decided to go back and look around some more. He didn't know what exactly he hoped to learn. Mostly he was curious. Dan was his uncle, after all. Come on, Quill, he called. In Dan's room, he studied the photograph on the wall. Dan gazed into the camera, looking handsome and very young. Way too young to be dead, Eric couldn't help thinking. Also, he had the feeling that Dan's serious, business-like expression was put on, as if he normally, the normally smiling, happy-go-lucky boy, thought this was the way the older soldier ought to look in his official military picture. Next, Eric examined the medal. He had never seen a Purple Heart before, but he knew this had to be one. Oma and Big Daryl must have been given the decoration after Dan was killed in action. Wanting to know more about Dan than the bare facts revealed by the flag and the medal on the photo, Eric opened the top dresser drawer. It contained postcards, report cards, some photos of Dan in his football uniform, and some 4-H ribbons like the ones on the mirror in his mother's old bedroom. The next two drawers held neatly folded clothes, t-shirts, and underwear and jeans. He wandered over to the closet. There were, there were several stiff, pressed army uniforms hanging there, a camouflage jacket and some denim and flannel shirts. Shoes were neatly lined up in a row on the floor, shiny, polished army boots, a pair of hunting boots, a pair of loafers, 
and some sneakers. The shininess of the boots caught Eric's attention. There was no dust on them or on anything in the room. After 34 years, he wondered. Then he realized that someone, Oma, of course it had to be, must come in here to clean. He pictured her lovingly dusting Dan's things and maybe saying his name out loud when Big Darrow wasn't home. It made him sad to think of it. On the overhead shelf in the closet was some camping stuff. A sleeping bag, a canteen, and a canvas sack with a shoulder strap that he recognized as a Boy Scout mess kit. Next to these things was a shoebox tied with a piece of twine. He reached for it and slipped off the twine. Inside was a dog collar, a leash, a couple of long tail feathers from a pheasant, and more photos of Dan with a yellow Labrador retriever. In sum, the dog was a puppy, and Dan was about Eric's age. One, labeled Elvis, 4-H obedient school graduate, showed Dan holding up a certificate and laughing as the dog's tongue bathed his face. Flipping through them, Eric could see the boy and the dog growing up together. Several photos were paper clipped together. The one on top was of Dan and Big Darrow, both dressed for hunting and holding shotguns. They stood beside Elvis, who held a male pheasant in his mouth. Dan and Big Darrow were both grinning like fools, and even Elvis seemed to be smiling proudly as he held his prize. The next day, the next, clearly taken on the same golden fall, showed Dan and Big Darrow kneeling beside Elvis in the fallen leaves. Dan held up a bird in each hand. Big Darrow had one arm around Dan and the other around Elvis's neck. Once again, they all looked deliriously happy. A third showed Oma, Big Daryl, and Dan sitting at the table, with Dan holding a carving knife and fork over a platter of roasted birds. Elvis stood by Dan. Everybody was giving a big cheesy smile to the picture taker, who Eric figured had to be his mom. As he studied the pictures, a fierce longing rose inside him. It was as if a lot of things he'd read and dreamed about and half imagined suddenly came into focus. He wanted to be the boy in those photographs, or to be like him at least. In the photos, Eric saw everything he had tried to explain to his mother about wanting to go hunting, plus something else he hadn't understood at the time, how a big part of the experience was sharing it with a dog. Eric had listened to Patrick and his dad talking about what a great dog Hotspots was, and how amazing she was at finding birds, but he hadn't exactly hunted with her. Looking at Dan and Elvis, he imagined them in the field working together, combining their skill and knowledge and instincts in the hunt. He wanted to have that experience with Quill. Along with all these thoughts and feelings, the photos raised even more questions about Big Daryl. It was impossible to believe that the casually affectionate man smiling in the pictures with his arm around Elvis and Dan was the same stern, grim-faced person Eric had met. The one who didn't hunt, who seemed to hate kids, well, Eric anyway, the one who had said, What's that dog doing in here? And, Didn't I say no more dogs? and the dog goes. It didn't make sense. With a sigh, Eric retied the twine around the box. As he reached up to return it to the shelf, he caught a glimpse of something leaning against the back wall of the closet. Pushing the hanging clothing to the side, he bent down and pulled out a 12-gauge semi-automatic shotgun. Wow, he murmured. He recognized the gun immediately in the same as the same one Dan had been holding in the photographs. Stacked against the rear wall of the closet were several boxes of shotgun shells. Quill, who had been sitting in a patch of sunlight by the window, came over and sniffed the gun with interest. You know what this is, don't you, Quill? Eric asked. He didn't think Oma would leave a loaded gun around the house, but he checked it to be sure. Pointing the muzzle forward toward the floor and keeping his fingers well away from the trigger, he pulled back the bolt. No cartridge popped out of the chamber, but he pulled the bolt a couple more times to make sure there weren't any shells in the magazine, either. He noticed a great metal plate on the wooden stock, engraved with a scene of a man standing, gun to his shoulder, over a dog on point. The dog stood with its tail straight out, front paw lifted, staring with great focus at a pheasant that was hiding in the brush. The dog looked an awful lot like Quill. Whoever the artist was, he was really good. Eric could almost see the dog quivering with contained excitement. Quill watched him as he hefted the gun, testing the length and weight of it. It felt good. He liked the smell of gun oil and the faint odor of gunpowder that clung to it. He lifted it to his shoulder and was sighting down the barrel when the phone rang. 
He froze for a moment. A rush of guilt flooded through him. Guilt at being caught snooping in Dan's room and handling Dan's gun. He felt this even as he realized it was silly. Whoever was on the phone couldn't see him. The guilt passed, followed by dread. He was pretty sure he knew who was calling. He forced himself to set the gun down and walked to Oma and Big Daryl's room. When he picked up the receiver, Dr. Bob's voice boomed. Eric, good news. I found the dog's owner. See you next time for Chapter 11.